Well, that's a fairground windmill. I'm sure you've seen one of those before. The wind, or in this case, my breath, hits the curved blades and causes them to rotate. Other things can make the blades rotate as well. In this tin can, I have boiling water. When water changes into water vapour, it takes up more than 600 times as much space. And so there's a pressure building up inside the can. But I have a hole in the top of the can, so there's a jet of steam issuing from that hole. And if I hold the windmill above that, you can see that the blades begin to turn. So it's a sort of steam engine, it's doing work. Now that's a fairly big, heavy set of blades. If I make a little windmill out of aluminium foil, and here's one with curved blades attached by a pin to a pencil, I can make that spin by blowing, or I can hold that over the jet of steam and we can make that spin quite rapidly. So there's a steam engine of one kind, but there are many other kinds as well. That's a tiny steam engine, can't do much work. But on a much bigger scale, huge steam engines last century did a lot of the work in industry and mining. And this is where the process started. It was the same principle. This is like Bean's tin can boiler. Inside there, 20 tonnes of wood were required to build up steam over three days, which was then piped off to the steam engine. In fact, this was one of four boilers that collectively drove the largest beam engine in the southern hemisphere. Now, just as with the tin can, the seam is a dangerous point. It can be the weakest point, and the thing could rupture. Very dangerous with the huge pressures generated. There's a seam there. You can see that it's bolted together, or really riveted together, in a rather special way. This cutaway shows you how. There are the plates of the boiler, each one 10 uh, millimetres thick, overlapping and between them the boilermakers put a corking compound to stop the steam escaping between them. Then through specially drilled holes these rivets were put in, red hot, hammered flat and as they cooled they contracted and drew the plates so closely together that that seam became not the weakest part but the strongest. But this and its three fellows generated steam, put it all together in a great big collecting duct and that went through the wall to the pistons next door. Now the steam comes through that large silver pipe and it's distributed by means of a series of control wheels and valves into these four cylinders here. The pressure of the steam inside those forced pistons up which make that enormous beam above me rock backwards and forwards. Now as it rocks backwards and forwards at the other end of it it has this rod attached to it and that pushes down on this crankshaft. It's a bit like your foot pushing down on the pedal of a bicycle. That in turn makes this wheel behind me rotate. That's a flywheel, an enormous thing, six metres in diameter, 16 tonnes in weight. The purpose of it is to keep the whole steam engine moving smoothly. The whole thing was made in Scotland and brought out by ship. This flywheel itself came in eight sections, each of them weighing two tonnes. And they were simply slotted together like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, no bolts or screws at all, and it worked perfectly. Well, that flywheel is attached to the two red balls on the vertical shaft over there. And as you know, that's a governor, and that controls the speed of the engine. Right now, it's running at a speed of one and a half revolutions per minute. It could run up to 12 revs per minute, but normally it operated about four or five revolutions per minute. Well, besides this particular shaft, there is another very important shaft going down there. It's that rod that I'm clutching and it's driving what I'm standing on, an absolutely massive piston. This is really the point of the whole exercise. The steam engine drove this piston, which is part of a huge pump that for 50 years supplied water to the city of Auckland. The water came from nearby Western Springs, and they of course were low-lying. But it had to be got to the city's reservoir, which was on the top of a hill. And this was the engine and the pump that did the job, pumping it all the way up for 50 years. Most of these engines went out of existence and they were replaced either by large diesel engines or huge electric ones. But the decline of this one was rather more basic. Today, Auckland's water supply comes from far away and rather higher up. It simply flows by gravity down to the reservoir and flows down again to the city. So the decline of this engine was not due to superior technology, but to simple gravity.